Welcome to Today's Walk with Dr. Roger Spradlin from Valley Baptist Church, the program helping you to understand the Bible today. Welcome to Today's Walk. I'm Kate Neighbors here with Pastor Roger Spradlin. Now we are going to jump into a special message today. Well, we're looking at Jonah chapter 3 today. Okay, let's jump in and watch Failure Does Not Have to Be Final. Open your Bibles with me today to the Old Testament book of Jonah chapter 3. We're continuing our series verse by verse through Jonah. We're looking in the third chapter today in a message that I'm calling Failure Doesn't Have to Be Final. Sometimes our life kind of gets off track a little bit, right? Well, Jonah's life got off track majorly. And the reality is sometimes that's us as well. We're like the old hymn that says, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. When life does get off track, though, the big question is this. How do we get back on track? How do we start over? Well, that's what Jonah chapter 3 is all about. Now, let me kind of recap the story for you where we're at. In chapter 1 of Jonah, Jonah is running from God. Jonah was a prophet living in Israel in about the 8th century before Christ. And God told him to go to Nineveh to preach. Now, Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire, and it was about 500 miles or so northeast of Israel. And they were the enemies of tiny Israel. So Jonah, he didn't want to go to Nineveh. It was really a matter of deep racial prejudice against the Assyrians. He didn't like the Assyrians. In fact, he hated them. He didn't think they deserved the grace of God. He, he wanted them to be destroyed by God. So Jonah essentially ran in the opposite direction. Instead of going east, he went west until he arrived at the Mediterranean coast. And then he caught a ship that was headed another thousand miles to the west. Now, you know the rest of the story. God created this great storm and uh, Jonah's ship is caught in the storm. The sailors, they're afraid. And so they find out Jonah's running from God. So they throw him overboard, thinking that will appease God and the storm will stop. And then there's this great fish that swallowed Jonah. So chapter one is Jonah running from God. Chapter two is Jonah running to God. The entire chapter is a prayer. In the belly of the fish, Jonah got right with God. But chapter three now is not Jonah running from God or running to God. It's Jonah running with God in obedience. He finally goes to Nineveh and he preaches and there is a great revival. In fact, it is the greatest story of mass conversion, perhaps in all of human history. The entire city repents and gets right with God. Now let's look at the details. Let's back up to chapter two, verse Number 10, it says, So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, You would think in reading this story, if you knew nothing about the story ahead of time, when Jonah swallowed by the fish, you'd go, Well, that's it. That's the end of the story. Jonah got his just deserts. He received the recompense for his sin and disobedience to God but that's not the end of the story. Because if we are willing to repent, God always offers us a second chance. In the belly of the fish, Jonah made some vows. He made some commitments. Now, what commitments do you think he made? Well, I can tell you what commitments I would have made if I would have been in the belly of the fish. I would say, Lord, that thing about me not going to Nineveh, I've changed my mind. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll say what you want me to say. I'll, I'll do what you want me to do. Well, that was Jonah. He's out of the fish and he headed west. Uh, he, or he was headed west and he swallowed with the fish. Now he's headed east. Um, actually, the Bible doesn't say the fish spit him onto the shore. The Bible says that it vomited him up. Can you imagine? I mean, Jonah, when you think about it, was really a, 
even though he was a prophet, at this point, he is a wretched human being. He, he, his heart is filled with racism and deep prejudice, and even the fish couldn't stomach Jonah. So he vomits him out. Can you imagine what that was like? I mean, uh, we know from chapter two that Jonah is dejected. His prayer is so full of emotion. We can feel it in his writing. But now in chapter three, he's not only dejected, he's ejected from the fish. Jonah was a mess. Uh, he's picking seaweed from around his neck because the Bible says he was wrapped in seaweed. His hair and even his eyebrows are probably gone. His skin is bleached from the gastric juices of the fish's digestive tract. He's probably a little smelly, wouldn't you think? <laughs> He probably tried to wash off the best he could in the waves of the Mediterranean, and, and then he heads east. God gave Jonah a second chance. Now, he didn't have to. Uh, God doesn't have to do anything by compulsion. We live today in many ways in what I would call the age of entitlement. We, we see that playing out in our, in our culture many times. People think they're entitled uh, the city is obligated to them. The state is obligated to them. The country is obligated to them. But God is not obligated to us. God could judge our sin any moment that he desires. But in grace, he extends mercy. He did with Jonah and with us. Jonah must have felt like a failure. But failure doesn't have to be final. I love the verse where it says that the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. God gives people a second chance because that's who he is. I mean, think of the people of the Bible. And there, there are a lot of stories in the Bible that we could talk about of people that God gave them uh, essentially a second chance. Uh, think about Abraham back in the book of Genesis. He's identified as the great man of faith, and yet he lied about his wife, Sarah, to Pharaoh in Egypt. This great man of faith, this progenitor of the Jewish race, was caught in an awful lie. Uh, it was after this great lie, though, that the child of promise was born of Isaac. And it was after the great lie that Abraham became known as a great man of faith because failure doesn't have to be final. Moses is uh, the mountain man, I guess, of the Old Testament. He's one of the greatest of all the prophets. And yet early in his life, he murdered someone. I mean, he's a murderer. He's banished from Egypt, or at least he's on the lamb. And he, he, he's gone for some 40 years before he came back. Moses had a problem with his temper. We see that not only in killing someone, obviously, but we see it later when he goes up on the top of Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments from God. They're on two tablets. God carved the tablets with, uh, with his own finger on stone, I suppose. And, and uh, Moses carried the tablets off the mountain after several days. And he sees the people that are having this big party and, and they're caught up in idolatry. And in anger, Moses smashed the tablets. And then he realizes, oh, man, I got to go do this again. He goes back up on the mountain, and this time he had to chisel them out of stone himself. But that's not really the end of Moses' temper. There was another time when the people were out in the desert and they wanted water, and God said uh, to Moses, just speak to this rock and water will come out. But Moses is so frustrated, these people that are complaining constantly that he's angry, instead of speaking to the rock, he struck the rock in anger. Moses never quite got control of his temper. Yet after 40 years, God gave him a second, a third, and a fourth chance because failure doesn't have to be final. Samson, he had more ability perhaps than anyone in the Old Testament. He was a brilliant man. He was the strongest man in history, and he squandered all that promise on promiscuity. But at the end of his life, he essentially prays for a second chance. And God gives it to him because failure doesn't have to be final. Maybe the greatest example in all of the Old Testament, for sure, of a second chance is David, the great king of Israel. When he was at the zenith of his power, both politically and militarily, 
he sees a young woman that is next door, a young woman that he knows is married, but he lusts after her and he commits adultery with her. In fact, today, we would actually categorize it as sexual abuse because it was not an equal relationship. David was the king. The woman's name was Bathsheba. She becomes pregnant. Uh, she's expecting David's child. Her husband, Uriah, is off to war. So David brings Uriah back for a few days, thinking that he will go in and sleep with his wife, and then everyone will think the baby belongs to Uriah. Uh, but Uriah refuses to go home, so David enters into a conspiracy to have Uriah killed so he can marry Bathsheba. So David's a co-conspirator in murder. He's an adulterer at best. He's a sexual predator at worst. And yet, it was after this incident with Bathsheba that he eventually repented and he remained the king for roughly 30 years. Oh, there were consequences in his life. His family was a wreck, really, from that point on. But many of the Psalms that we love so much that David composed was after the sin and the murder of Uriah and the thing with Bathsheba. Why? Because failure doesn't have to be final. When we come to the New Testament, we, we see Peter. He's kind of the leader of the apostles, the unofficial leader. And it was the night before the crucifixion when Jesus gathered with these close disciples in order to observe the Passover meal. And he tells them that night that someone at the table is going to betray me. And Peter says, oh, I'll never deny you. I'll never leave you. And Jesus said, Peter, before the rooster crows three times with the morning dawn, you will deny me three times. Peter is scandalized by that. He is shocked by it. He doesn't believe it. No, he protests, I will never leave you. Well, that night Jesus is arrested and most of the disciples, they've run into the dark and fear. But Peter follows at a distance and Jesus is taken to the high priest Caiaphas' house. It's kind of up on a hill a little bit. And, and Peter is down below the house at a fire. And there's this young maiden that says, hey, you're one of the followers of Jesus. And for the third time, Peter denies Jesus. Denies even knowing. And he punctuates his denial with profanity. And at that very moment, he looks up the hill at Caiaphas' house where Jesus was on trial, and they're taking a little break, I guess, and Jesus looks over the banister or over the balcony, and his face is puffy and, and, and bleeding where he's been beaten. And for just a moment, Jesus and Peter lock eyes, and the rooster crows. And Peter realizes that he has denied his Lord three times. The Bible says that he went out into the night, and he wept bitterly. I think in repentance. Later, after the crucifixion, the death, and then the resurrection of our Lord, the women came to the, the tomb and Jesus said to them, go tell the disciples and Peter that I'm alive. He singled out Peter. And later, Jesus completely restored Peter. He gave him a second chance because that's the nature of God. He gives us a second chance and sometimes a third chance and a four. Why? Because failure doesn't have to be final. God restored Jonah. He didn't have to, he didn't have to but he did. He, he didn't just forgive him. And when the fish vomited him out, he didn't say, okay, okay Peter, or okay, okay, Jonah, I mean, I forgive you. You go home and you live a good life. He puts him back on the same mission. It would be like if the president of the United States pardoned someone that's on death row. And he says, not only are you pardoned and you're free, but now you're going to be my ambassador. That's what he essentially says to Jonah. When we run from God and we come back to God, we still stand at the same fork in the road that took us in the wrong direction to begin with. You still face the same temptations that led you away from God. We have to learn to make different decisions the second time or the third time. Verse number two. God says, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. 
So Jonah rose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. Uh, Here's the principle. God defines the message of salvation, not us. God said, go to Nineveh, that great city. Now, in the Hebrew, it is literally a city great to God. It's, it's not just that it seemed to be a great city politically. God called it a great city. Well, how was Nineveh a great city? Well, it certainly was great in its size. It says it's three days journey to be able to walk across it. So that would be a big city. But there's a little bit of problem here that I got to tell you about. We know where the ruins of Nineveh are. It's the outside of the modern city of Mosul. Uh, and archaeologists have uncovered much of the ruins of Nineveh. And it was a city that was only about eight miles across, which is a big city for the ancient world, but it doesn't take three days to walk eight miles. So for years, archaeologists have argued that the Bible is errant here, that it was not as big a city as what the Bible says. But we now know more from archaeology. They have discovered an outer wall that included what we would call suburbs of about a 60-mile circumference. So it was a great city as far as size. It was a great city in influence. It was in many ways the capital of, of the world at that time. It was certainly a great city in great in sin. The people were violent. They were aggressive. They were cruel. They were imperialistic. They were known for conquering tribe after tribe and nation after nation, subjugating them into slavery. Now, when we read the book of Jonah at one setting, that's how it's written to be just read complete. The drama is building and building and building. God speaks to Jonah and he runs. He's caught in a storm and then he's in the belly of the fish. Then he's regurgitated and then he goes to Nineveh. And in the drama, you begin to wonder, what is he going to say? What is going to happen next? What did he say? God told Jonah, you preach only what I tell you to say. When he got to Nineveh, he preached a very simple message. He said, in 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. I really think that's part of the reason Jonah was such a popular preacher in Nineveh, because his sermon was so short. <laughs> it's only eight words in English. It's only five in Hebrew. Now, he probably struggled linguistically. He spoke Hebrew, and they spoke a different language, so he probably had to memorize his, his message in the Assyrian dialect. So it was a very, very brief message. In 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. Now, perhaps he elaborated on that message, but that was the crux of his message. It was brief, it was repetitious, and it was blunt. You talk about preaching a turn or burn sermon. This wasn't turn or burn. This was just burn. In 40 days, your city will be destroyed. But I think that grace is implied in the message because there's a deadline out there. Now, Noah preached for 120 years. There was no deadline, but Jonah only had 40 days. And he said, in 40 days, it's very specific, Nineveh will be destroyed. But the deadline assumes, I think, the opportunity of grace. Otherwise, why preach at all? Just let him be surprised by the destruction. Or come the day before and say, God's going to destroy you. And then zap, God destroys the city. Why is there 40 days? The implication is during these 40 days, you have an opportunity to repent. You have an opportunity to believe. And God will respond to your belief. We see that later on. God says to Jonah, you only preach what I tell you to say. That's what preaching should be. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, he talks about the foolishness of preaching, and he ties that to the centrality of preaching uh, the cross and, and Jesus. When you think about it, the biblical message is really pretty simple. It's not complicated at all. We declare that God is, he exists, God loves us, yet we have sinned. God sent his son to die for us. 
We are to repent and to believe. If we do that, God will give us eternal life. And once we have eternal life, we're to live for him. I mean, that's it. Simple, right? Every week I preach that same message or a variation of it. It doesn't matter where I'm at in the Bible. I preach the same message. God is. God loves us. We have all sinned. We've all messed up. If we repent and believe, God will forgive us and give us eternal life. And now that we're forgiven, we're to live for him. I mean, that's it. I'm simply, as a preacher, a mouthpiece for the text. And that's what God said, Jonah, you just be my mouthpiece. You say what I tell you to say. Now, this is my opinion. It's just my opinion. I think it is an act of arrogance for a preacher to do anything else. Any idea that I have, apart from the Bible, about God, or any idea that I have apart from the Bible about life is no better than any idea that you have about God or about life. Here's the deal. We don't get to make up the message. God's revealed the message. We don't define the message. We just declare the message. We don't design the message. We just declare it. We, when we try to contort what God has said in an effort to make it more palatable to modern man. We do not only a disservice to God, but we do a disservice to modern man. Because there are those who say today, well, pre, in the pre-modern world, the idea of sacrifice and the idea of a bloody savior on the cross, that worked, but it no longer works. Oh, yes, it still works. God still changes people's lives in response to their faith. We don't design the message. We simply declare it. Uh, God just wants his message to be proclaimed. Not what I think, not what I read, not what I imagine, not what I make up, not what some philosopher says, not what some psychiatrist says. God wants us to declare his word. And that's what he said to Jonah. You say what I tell you to say. You are my mouthpiece. Now, that's why I preach the way I do. The vast majority of the time, we just move through the Bible, verse or a book of the Bible, verse by verse. You know why I do that? So that we as a congregation, those listening, can see the whole of God's word. When we see the whole of God's word, it brings balance. If every week I just preached it, picked at random a scripture and we read that and talked about that verse, then it'd be real easy to get out of balance because there are certain things that I probably wouldn't, that I probably would avoid because they're unpleasant. Or I would gravitate to certain things that really appeals to me. But when we look verse by verse at the whole of God's word, it brings a sense of spiritual balance. In expository preaching, that is verse by verse preaching, we eventually will talk about the wrath of God. But at some point, we'll talk about the love of God. We'll talk about the mercy of God, but we'll also talk about the judgment of God. We'll talk about the offer of salvation and mercy, but we'll also talk about the necessity of repentance. We'll talk about the futility of legalism, but we'll also talk about God's expectation of holiness. When we look at the whole counsel of God, it brings this wonderful sense of spiritual balance. Now, look at, with me at verse 5. Verse 4 it said that, you know, 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Verse 5, so the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then the word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by decree of the king and his nobles say, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let every man turn from his evil way and from the violence that it is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger 
so that we may not perish. Isn't that an amazing statement? That the whole city believed. That's almost an amazing statement in the book. The whole city, everyone in Nineveh believed in God. And they proclaimed a fast. They put on sackcloth, which was a a symbol of their contrition for their sin, from the greatest to the least. In in other words, the whole city, even the king was contrite. He humbled himself. He said, we're all going to fast. Even the animals are going to fast. Here's the principle. God always offers mercy in response to faith. The greatest miracle in Jonah is not the fish swallowing a man. The greatest miracle in Jonah is not surviving inside the fish. The greatest miracle is that an entire city believed in God. We're not talking about an individual or a family. We're talking about an entire city turned to God. And when it says they believed, it's the same word that is used in the book of Genesis when it says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. That was a wonderful message from our series looking at the book of Jonah. Pastor Roger, I I love the verse uh, in that chapter that talks about the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. It is a great verse because it indicates to us that God is the God of a second chance. You know, Jonah's kind of an extreme case. He's not your run-of-mill person of faith. He's a prophet and he should have known better. And he didn't just drift from God like we sometimes do. He literally ran (laughs) from God, (laughs) ran in the opposite direction from God. And yet God gave him a second chance Mm -hmm. because God is a father. In fact, he's a perfect father, which for us, that's an oxymoron. (laughs) There's no perfect (laughs) earthly fathers, but God is. And he's willing to extend to us a second and a third chance. In fact, We can never get further from God than one prayer. Mm. We're always that close to God. It's just one prayer away from being right with Him. Maybe you are watching today and you're hearing what Pastor Roger has to say. This idea that you can pray, you can call out to God. There is a number at the bottom of the screen and there are people who would love to, to answer your questions, to open up the Bible and show you that God is a God of second chances. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this um, series on Jonah. It's it's a fun, I remember as a kid learning yeah. about it. So it's fun as an adult to just dive in a little bit deeper and, and learn and grow. If you'd like a free copy of today's message or any of our messages from Today's Walk, visit us, todayswalk.org, and definitely join us next week as we help you understand the Bible today. Today's Walk is the broadcast ministry of Valley Baptist Church. This program is supported directly by our church members and viewers like you. You'll find plenty of great resources when you call us or visit our website. Thank you for watching and join us again next week for today's walk from Valley Baptist Church in Bakersfield, California.